colleagues, adults, children all over the world. It's really a pleasure today to have our second uh, day of the Pavilion high-level session. Today, as it is Finance and Health Day, we have with us uh, two icons representing the World Health Organization and the Africa Development Bank, uh, starting with our first high-level speaker, His Excellency, Can you the Director of the World Health Organization. So I can see my... Yes, Dr. Uh, Tedros, who is with us from Geneva. And so, Dr. Tedros, it's really a pleasure to have you with us today in this uh, short high-level dialogue with young people from all over the world. And we would love to uh, hear your insights. And especially a question that we have uh, from you to start the conversation is, wh what are your expectations and messages to global youth on being advocates around climate and health agenda? So, Excellency, uh, you, you have the floor. Thank you very much, moderator. Dear children and youth from all around the world, good morning to all of you. It's a pleasure to join you. In 2019, I had the opportunity to visit several nations in the Pacific where climate change is stealing homes and stealing hope. I visited Tonga, where they are moving hospitals to higher ground and planting mangroves to fight back against encroaching seas and erosion. I was shown one area that used to be a rugby ground where Tonga and Fiji once played but which the sea has now taken. I also visited Tuvalu, which will be underwater within a century unless we take urgent action. The Prime Minister of Tuvalu has warned that any further temperature increase will spell the total damage of his nation. While I was in Tuvalu, I met a young boy called Falu. I was so impressed with his knowledge of climate change. But he told me that he had been discussing with his friends what they would do if Tuvalu sinks, and that the majority of his friends had decided that they would sink with Tuvalu. Those words disturbed and saddened me, because a child of that age should be having fun with his friends not worrying about whether he will still have a home when he grows up or when she grows up. It brought home to me what is at stake for the young people of our world. Small island states like Tonga and Tuvalu are the least responsible for climate change, but face the most severe consequences. Likewise, Children and young people are the least responsible for climate change, but we live with its effects throughout their lives. Which is why we must listen to the voices of young people, because they have the most to lose from a warming planet and the most to gain from climate action. You're raising your voices to draw attention to the damage that others are doing to the world that you and your children and grandchildren will inhabit. For too long, we have plundered our planet, poisoned our air, polluted our water, and traded our future health for profit today. The global addiction to fossil fuels is not just an act of vandalism. It's an act of self-sabotage. The emissions we pump into the air are literally suffocating us and making our planet less fit for human habitation. There will be a heavy price to pay if we fail to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. The price will be human health, and it will be paid not by those responsible for the damage, 
but by people like you and those who come after you. So you must continue to raise your voices to call for a change, of course, before it's too late. WHO is listening because we know that a healthy planet means healthy people. The only way things will change is with your energy, your voices, and your leadership. The future health of our planet and the future health of our pe of people belongs to you and depends on you. I thank you and moderator back to you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for, for the wise words. And uh, yeah, as an African myself, as the young people who are the least contributing to this crisis, we realize how important it is to be the inspiration and be the world of reminding all those polluters and contributors to work together to, 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 to save our planet and save our health. Your Excellency, we understand we had some technical issues and some delays. Is it okay if we still entertain a question from the audience to interact with Your Excellency if your time allows? I'm actually rushing to another meeting, but maybe one question would be okay. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Do we have any questions from the young people for His uh, Excellency? Okay. Please introduce your, your name, uh, your uh, organization, country, and your question. Uh, hello, Your Excellency. Uh, thank you for your time. My name is Miriam. I'm from uh, Morocco and I'm representing the International Federation of Medical Students Association. Um, so you have stated that uh, youth has a major um, role to play uh, to fight against climate change. And we know that uh, health is at stake. Uh, so my question for you is how WHO attempts to work um, towards a more uh, capacitated, informed and engaged uh, healthcare workforce, maybe through um, uh, a curricula that is adapted to these challenges about climate change and health. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. That's a very, very good question. Uh, as you rightly said, uh, we, we, we have to uh, improve our curriculum so that our workforce uh, has the knowledge and the capacity uh, to address. Uh, but at the same time, we cannot do this without the involvement of youth like, like you. And that's why WHO has established the Global Youth Council. The big six are now members of the Youth Council, and we will interact with you on a regular basis to influence all the things that we do. Because as I said earlier, the future is yours, and we have worked with you to make it better for you, for our children, for the children of our children, so that we can have a better planet. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. And we keep uh, personally applauding the efforts that WHO is pushing for, either through the Youth Council or the Big Six. And we look forward to working together to unite in young people to push for the health and climate agenda. Uh, thank you for being with us, Excellency. And moving on to our second... Shukran, 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 Gazilan, and all the best. Shukran, Gazilan. Thank you. Ma'asalama. So, Ma'asalama. Ma'asalama. Of course, moving on uh, to another African high-level uh, speaker with us today. And it's an honor to have you with us, uh, Dr. Martin uh, from the African Development Bank. You are, of course, the director of the Agriculture Department and which is a lot of pressure and also you've been working for the past 25 years on the agriculture and climate finance uh, area and also as also the chief advisor of the Nigerian uh, ministry and so wearing a lot of hats and we would love to hear from your excellency as well some reflections since today is climate finance day and you know uh, maybe to start the conversation by addressing us about the meaningful youth engagement and inclusion in the theme of finance with a lens of Africa. So yeah, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much, um, Saad and Oakas. Thank you. And congratulations for the very first children and youth pavilion at COP, the very first. Well done. I also want to say good morning, children and young people. To you belongs the future. 
everything we're talking about today in another 20 years would affect you directly. And I bring you greetings from Dr. Beth Dunford, the Vice President of Agriculture, Human and Social Capacity Development at the African Development Bank. She is not able to be with us today, but she sent some messages to you, particularly on finance for young people. We all know that young people, your passion, your energy is needed to move forward every agenda, including climate change. So here are, are the words from President, Vice President Beth Dunford. Greetings, distinguished guests. Greetings to our youth and allies of children and youth. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this celebration of the first ever Children and Youth Pavilion at the United Nations Climate Change Conference. COP27 theme of the day is finance. Our delegates focus on the opportunities to finance initiatives for children and youth. Today, I'll be casting a light on that theme on Africa. Africa is home to 1.4 billion people. The number of African young people defined as people between the ages of 18 and 35 is projected to reach 830 million by 2050. The average median age in Africa is just around 19 years. In Uganda, 78% of the population is below 30 years, making Uganda the world's youngest country by population. The challenge is that this massive youth population wants, needs to work. In Africa, youth unemployment remains very high at 12.5% across the continent for 15 to 24 year olds. And if we look at the general youth unemployment in Southern Africa, the percentage skyrockets to an average of 52.5%. The percentage is- Recording stopped if we consider underemployment and vulnerability of young people working in the informal economy. Employers tell us the lack of relevant skills is a major constraint to their businesses. It is estimated that 2% of Africa's total university age population acquired science, technology, engineering, or mathematical skills, also known as STEM skills. Just 2%, think about it for a minute. These challenges inhibit the continent's effort to address youth employment and employability. We must call for comprehensive action that will strengthen Africa's social and economic development. Another challenge is about impact of climate change. You know Africa contributes the least to global warming and has the lowest emissions. But at the same time, the continent faces existence existential collateral climate change damage, posing risks to the economies, food systems, livelihoods, and, and to the youth. For example, extreme weather of drought and flooding, pest infestation and water scarcity are major risks for youth businesses, particularly in agriculture. But we can turn that around. I'm joining you today because I believe that investing in entrepreneurship and created creation of jobs, including climate resilient jobs for youth is the future. Creating jobs, decent jobs, is at the center of the African Development Bank's strategy for inclusive and green growth. The bank has teamed up with the Global Center for Adaptation to mobilize $25 billion to scale up transformative and climate change adaptation actions across Africa. Under the program, the bank has what we call the African Youth Climate Council. This council is an institutional connection between youth and decision makers. This connection will ensure young people can be integrated ac across decision-making processes. Some of you have heard, and I encourage you to apply for our Empowering Youth for Entrepreneurship and Job Creation in Climate Change Adaptation and resilience. It's a mouthful, but we call, youth, we call it Youth Adapt for short. Youth Adapt aims to mobilize $1.25 billion to bring skills to 1 million young entrepreneurs and to support 10,000 
youth-led small and medium enterprises or SMEs in climate adaptation and green jobs. It will also unlock $500 million for access to finance, finance that will help grow your current and future businesses. Over the last year, Youth Adapt provided more than $3 million in grants to 30 young and women-led startups. In stopping, I just want to share some examples, success stories of young entrepreneurs. We supported Ye Wande Adebowale, a PhD graduate in Nigeria who runs a startup using plastic waste to make footwear. With our grant funding, she expanded her company to, a, to, to process 30, 381 million metric tons of plastic waste produced every year in Nigeria into shoes. Youth Adapt also helped Caroline Mwangi, the founder of Kim Planter Seedlings and Nurseries in Kenya. Our financing and training work is designed to scale up production of drought tolerance crop seedlings for 1,200 farmers in Kenya and Uganda. I can go on and on, but let me stop here and, and say, in closing, I'll tell you a little bit about our new program called the Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Bank. It's a bank for young people. Millions of young people cannot get loans, but this bank will help you get loans to ensure your business is successful. Thank you so much for listening to, to me this morning, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fregeni, and it's always great to have you. And you know uh, what you said about the youth adapt, and we're going to have a session on Saturday about it and hear more about the success successful stories of young people uh, being able to make impact on, on climate because, of course, of uh, climate finance. And it's really important to have this uh, finance and financial institutions support. And I look personally forward as an African to hear more about this youth entrepreneurship new fund and hopefully how African youth and also even global youth can, can interact and, uh, uh, you know, benefit from it. Uh, so uh, before maybe... Uh, moving, yeah, moving to questions. I will entertain one or two questions from the floor. Uh, if anyone has a question to His Excellency, please raise your hand and we'll give you uh, the mic. So uh, please, your name, your country, organization, and uh, ask your question. So I'll start with my brother there and then give, give the mic there. So, yes. Hi, Excellency. Thank you for these uh, great words. Uh, I'm Aya Sharkawi from Egypt, from Ministry of uh, Youth and Sports. Yes, uh, my question is, how can the session makers uh, work to improve the engagement of uh, the African and the Egyptian, uh, especially Egyptian uh, farmers, in um, the climate change mitigation and adaptation process, and how can they can uh, improve their awareness of the climate change impacts in general? Thank you. Pass, passing the mic there to, to, to my brother. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the, the man from Africa Development Bank. As we are talking about climate finance, we should not forget to speak about transition finance because banks have been supporting fossil fuel companies. And if we continue to support fossil fuel companies, this means you are fearing climate crisis. And this means that you are exposing us uh, in the situation that he, he, you are exposing that in a, in a climate crisis space. So would you please make a public statement that Africa Development Bank is not financing fossil fuel companies? Take, we'll take two questions for now. Uh, just, just maybe if we can have a second round later, uh, and also we have also a time constraints. Uh, just I wanted to acknowledge and thank uh, the His Excellency, the Minister of Youth and Sports of Egypt, for also joining us in the pavilion today. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, and hopefully uh, after this you can join us in the family picture that we will take uh, just after we finish this round of questions and answers. So back in, back to you, Your Excellency. All right, all right, all right thank you. Let me begin by responding to my Egyptian sister. That's a very good question, because smallholder farmers, they suffer disproportionately from climate change. When it's a flood, when it's a drought, they are the ones who actually suffer the most. 
So the, you have asked a very qu good question. How do we involve them in the process to design more resilient and more, you know, um, 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 adapted systems? You know, for both. so I think there are three ways. There are three ways. The first is at the grassroots level. We, we have what we call innovation platforms, where we involve civil society groups like farm organizations, we involve government, Ministry of Agriculture, we, we, we also involve very importantly the private sector to come together and design solutions. It could be small scale water harvesting or small scale irrigation, but we actually work, work, work with them. That is at the first level. The second level is at the level of the, of the Honorable Minister, and I'm, and I'm glad the Honorable Minister is here. They have to involve you in all their planning, and, and there are ways of doing that. Emsad here is, is a very good example. He represents a lot of young people. I'm sure he has access to the, to the minister. So at the national level, all the planning also has to hear the voice of the young people. Anyway, I, I hope my response is, um, is fine. And so to, to my colleague, um, um, asking about just transition, I agree with you, we must all get to 1.5 um, increase in temperature by the end of the century. I agree with you. The, the climate change is real and we must all do our best. But, and it's a big but, you cannot penalize Africa's development at the extent, at the extent of helping the world to reach because we have almost done nothing to, 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 to add to climate, climate warming, right? So you have to balance the fact that Africa needs to develop. Africa needs light. You know, more than 60% of Africans live and all their lives in darkness once the sun goes down. That's unacceptable. So we have to ensure that Africa continues to develop. At the same time, we have to ensure that the, the world actually drives towards, you know, um, 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 only 1.5 increase in, in, you know, in temperature. So for, for us at, at the bank, we put priority on Africa's development. Of course, we, 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 we try not to encourage more in, you know, increase in greenhouse emissions, but Africa's development is priority. We, we cannot accept that Africa's development is more gauged because we have to drive towards, it's just not acceptable. Africans have to eat, they have to clothe themselves, they have to have light, they have to entertain themselves, and we are trying to fund that, and to support that. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. And that's, that's, that's where the need for climate finance is, where countries in our continent, in small island states, are suffering the double crisis of development and transition. This is where climate finance should be there from the global community to ensure this justice and ensure we catch up. Thank you very much for, having, uh, for being with us today. And thank you 